It was in turning the so-called Indians into the minds of the Americans who worked, who worked there to bring up gold and silver that went to Europe. It was the war that was made against China, 1841 and 42, that they referred to as the Opium War, that forced China to take opium, forced China to become a, na a nation of junkies in order to buy English tea. This was a part of the process that created what they call the accumulation of capital. And of course, it was the theft of this land that we stand on right now that, that, that created this wealth and created a world economy and a world system. So the world has been flipped upside down. Those of us who had freedom no longer have freedom. Those of us who have had resources and health no longer have that. And now we are at the mercy of a system that was imposed on us by, by forces who, 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 who uh, parasites who created this uh, terrible state of affairs. And it is a parasitic social system. America is a predatory state. It didn't, it, people talk about how bad it is uh, the America could do these things in places like Guantanamo. Um, if they do it in prisons in Philadelphia, right here. California has the second largest prison. California has the second largest prison system in the world. In the entire world. They practice here first. They got it right, and then they took it to Guantanamo. Then they took it to Iraq and all the other places around the world. But what has been happening, especially since what we refer to as the Second Imperialist War, they call it World War II. And that was a war between bandits. There were no good work guys in that war. It was a war to redivide the world. It was the kind of wars that we used to read about that happened with the mafia. It was a soprano thing, where some groups were not satisfied with, the, with what they got the last time around in stealing the world. And so with this war, the Second Imperialist War, it created space. As the Europeans, gangsters, the capitalist thugs, were engaged in fighting with each other, it created enough space so that struggles for national liberation took off in a very serious way. That's not what they teach us. They say the reason we saw these struggles happening all around the world is because in World War I, we went to Europe and fought for Europeans. And when we went to Europe, we discovered what democracy really was and decided that we had to have some in the places that we came from. But the reality was that Europeans couldn't teach us anything about democracy. And the thing is that it provided us enough space. The preoccupation that the Europeans were engaged in with themselves in this war created space. And so we saw an escalation of the struggles for national liberation in the 1940s. 1947, Indi India became nominally independent. 1949, the glorious Chinese revolution. 1950s, we saw revolution happening, or attempted revolution is happening all over the world, in Latin America. Uh, 1959, of course, the Cuban Revolution, uh, a magnificent Cuban Revolution. And then, of course, in 1954, you remember the U.S. intent on pushing back struggles, overthrew the government of our bins in Guatemala. In 1954-55, the government of Iran, the elected government of Iran was overthrown by the U.S. government. Struggles were happening by peoples all around the world. 1960s, the courageous Vietnamese people carried the whole colonial world on their shoulders as it fought tit for tat against U.S. imperialism and defeated it. Defeated U.S. imperialism. This is, this is, you see, the emergence of crisis of a parasitic social system that requires the rest of the world uh, to be on its belly as a condition for its existence. America functions perfectly. Imperialism functions perfectly as long as we are in chain, as long as we are on our knees. It works. It works perfectly. But what has been happening, because it requires it, a host requires a parasite. That's the folly, of course, of those people who we know, who, convince, who try to convince us that the problem is that we just got to tweak the system to make it work. That's the folly of anybody who thinks that Barack Obama actually represents change that you can believe in. Uh, and to assume, to assume that, a, that a parasite would give you the right to vote 
to end its relationship with you. I mean, think about that. A parasite needs a host as a condition for its existence. That's why Obama had to run as an un-African. He couldn't run as a black man or an African. He ran as an un-African. That's why he had to say the question of race no longer exists. That's why he was the first candidate who, who ran for office during this election who said who, he was opposed to reparations for African people. It was Obama that gave the other white candidates permission to say that. So th this, this is the reality that we are confronted with. It's a parasitic social system that oppresses the world and requires the oppression of the world for its existence. It's not no, no mistake. They, they take a situation, for example, like what you see in Iraq. You see in Iraq, somebody creates a, does a massacre, a kill, kills a family rapes uh, women and what have you. And then every now and then they will put these persons on trial and say, and, and of course the idea here is that this is the crime. The crime of course is not that. The crime is their presence as an occupying force in Iraq in the first place. That's the crime. That's the crime. And so imperialism will do what it can to excuse itself. It has taught us who we are. It has taught us who we are. It has taught us how to get along with each other. Imperialism taught us this. It has set up the schools. You may have read in the early 1990s of a situation in a place called Rwanda, where perhaps in an eight week period, something like a million Africans were murdered, brutally murdered. And all the commentators sat back and say, look at how the savages kill themselves. They even say that it was better when white people controlled it. But what they didn't tell us was that the people who lived in that area they called Rwanda lived perfectly well among themselves before the intrusion of European colonialism. That the Hutu uh, and the Tutsi and the Batwa had no problem with each other before European imperialism intervened there. That it was, the, it was first uh, the Germans who set up uh, the system there, and then of course when they lost the war, the first imperialist war, Europeans got together and gave that area to, to Belgium because Germany was on the wrong side. It's telling you, it's a law to redivide the world. So they gave Rwanda to Belgium. It's Belgium who set up the education system in Rwanda. And this education system in Rwanda taught the Hutu Tutsi by Tutsi that since you are tall and slim, you look more like white people. You are the nobility. And they taught the Bahutu, who are agriculturists, uh, that you are the serfs and the peasants. This is what they, they put it in the educational system. This is what they taught the people about themselves. They set up the system. They taught the people. And in the 1960s, when like Congo, in other places in Africa, the people said that we want the Belgians out of here. The Belgians created their own organization among the Rwandan population. They created an organization of, of, because it was the Tutsi, the ones that they had put in charge, the one that they thought would be good service and would serve them forever. That was demanding independence from Belgium. And so they created a, a Hutu organization that said, we don't want to be independent from Belgium until first we get rid of our Tutsi nobility. And they set up a murderous attack under Belgian leadership against the Tutsis. And that is the thing that 30 years later or more, we saw a result in the horror that they call Rwanda. Because we define ourselves based on institutions that the imperialists have imposed on us. We are defined, we are, we are the law, we have been defined by them.